Chapter 4 of the Autobiography of Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Autobiography of Anthony Trollope. Chapter 4 Ireland. My first two novels. 1841 to 1848. In the preceding pages, I have given a short record of the first twenty six years of my life years of suffering disgrace and inward remorse i fear that my mode of telling will have left an idea simply of their absurdities but in truth i was wretched sometimes almost unto death and have often cursed the hour in which i was born there had clung to me a feeling that i had been looked upon always as an evil an encumbrance a useless thing as a creature of whom those connected with him had to be ashamed. And I feel certain now that in my young days I was so regarded. Even my few friends who had found with me a certain capacity for enjoyment were half afraid of me. I acknowledge the weakness of a great desire to be loved, of a strong wish to be popular with my associates. No child, no boy, no lad, no young man, had ever been less so. And I had been so poor, and so little able to bear poverty. But from the day on which I set my foot in Ireland, all these evils went away from me. Since that time, who has had a happier life than mine? Looking round upon all those I know, I cannot put my hand upon one. But all is not over yet and mindful of that, remembering how great is the agony of adversity, how crushing the despondency of degradation, how susceptible I am myself to the misery coming from contempt, remembering also how quickly good things may go and evil things come, I am often again tempted to hope, almost to pray, that the end may be near. Things may be going well now. Sin aliquem infandum casum, Fortuna minaris, nunc o oh, nunc liceat crudelum abrumpere vitam. There is unhappiness so great that the very fear of it is an alloy to happiness. I had then lost my father and sister and brother, have since lost another sister and my mother, but I have never as yet lost a wife or a child. When I told my friends that I was going on this mission to Ireland, they shook their heads, but said nothing to dissuade me. I think it must have been evident to all who were my friends that my life in London was not a success. My mother and elder brother were at this time abroad, and were not consulted, did not even know my intention in time to protest against it. Indeed, I consulted no one, except a dear old cousin, our family lawyer, from whom I borrowed two hundred pounds to help me out of England. He lent me the money, and looked upon me with pitying eyes, shaking his head. After all, you were right to go, he said to me when I paid him the money a few years afterwards. But nobody then thought I was right to go. To become clerk to an Irish surveyor in Connaught, with a salary of a hundred pounds a year, at twenty-six years of age. I did not think it right even myself, except that anything was right which would take me away from the general post office and from London. My ideas of the duties I was to perform were very vague, as were also my ideas of Ireland generally. Hitherto I had passed my time seated at a desk, either writing letters myself or copying into books those which others had written. I had never been called upon to do anything I was unable or unfitted to do. I now understood that in Ireland I was to be a deputy inspector of country post offices, and that among other things to be inspected would be the postmaster's accounts. But as no other person asked a question as to my fitness for this work, it seemed unnecessary for me to do so. On the 15th of September, 1841, I landed in Dublin, without an acquaintance in the country, and with only two or three letters of introduction from a brother clerk in the post office. I had learned to think that Ireland was a land flowing with fun and whiskey, in which irregularity was the rule of life, and where broken hands were looked upon as honorable badges. 
I was to live at a place called Banneher, on the Shannon, which I had heard of because of its having once been conquered, though it had heretofore conquered everything, including the devil. And from Banneher my inspecting tours were to be made chiefly into Connaught, but also over a strip of country eastwards, which would enable me occasionally to run up to Dublin. I went to a hotel which was very dirty, and after dinner I ordered some whiskey punch. There was an excitement in this, but when the punch was gone I was very dull. It seemed so strange to be in a country in which there was not a single individual whom I had ever spoken to or even seen, and it was to be my destiny to go down into Connaught and adjust accounts, the destiny of me who had never learned the multiplication table or done a sum in long division. On the next morning I called on the secretary of the Irish post office, and learned from him that Colonel Maberly had sent a very bad character with me. He could not have sent a very good one, but I felt a little hurt when I was informed by this new master that he had been informed that I was worthless, and must in all probability be dismissed. But, said the new master, I shall judge you by your own merits. From that time to the day on which I left the service, I never heard a word of censure, nor had many months passed before I found that my services were valued. Before a year was over, I had acquired the character of a thoroughly good public servant. The time went very pleasantly. Some adventures I had, two of which I told in the tales of all countries, under the names of the O'Connors of Castle Connor, and Father Giles of Ballymoy. I will not swear to every detail in these stories, but the main purport of each is true. I could tell many others of the same nature, were this the place for them. I found that the surveyor to whom I had been sent kept a pack of hounds, and therefore I bought a hunter. I did not think he liked it, but he could not well complain. He never rode to hounds himself, but I did, and then and thus began one of the great joys of my life. I have ever since been constant to the sport, having learned to love it with an affection which I cannot myself fathom or understand. Surely no man has labored at it as I have done, or hunted under such drawbacks as to distances, money, and natural disadvantages. I am very heavy, very blind, have been, in reference to hunting, a poor man, and am now an old man. I have often had to travel all night outside a mail-coach in order that I might hunt the next day. Nor have I ever been, in truth, a good horseman. And I have passed the greater part of my hunting life under the discipline of the civil service. But it has been for more than thirty years a duty to me to ride to hounds, and I have performed that duty with a persistent energy. Nothing has ever been allowed to stand in the way of hunting neither the writing of books, nor the work of the post office, nor other pleasures. As regarded the post office, it soon seemed to be understood that I was to hunt, and when my services were retransferred to England, no word of difficulty ever reached me about it. I have written on very many subjects, and on most of them with pleasure, but on no subject with such delight as that on hunting. I have dragged it into many novels into too many, no doubt, but I have always felt myself deprived of a legitimate joy when the nature of the tale has not allowed me a hunting chapter. Perhaps that which gave me the greatest delight was the description of a run on a horse accidentally taken from another sportsman, a circumstance which occurred to my dear friend Charles Buxton, who will be remembered as one of the members for Surrey. It was altogether a very jolly life that I led in Ireland. I was always moving about, and soon found myself to be in pecuniary circumstances which were opulent in comparison with those of my past life. The Irish people did not murder me, nor did they even break my head. I soon found them to be good-humoured, clever, the working class is very much more intelligent than those of England, economical and hospitable. We hear much of their spendthrift nature, but extravagance is not the nature of an Irishman. He will count the shillings in a pound much more accurately than an Englishman, and will with much more certainty get twelve pennyworth from each. But they are perverse, irrational, and but little bound by the love of truth. I lived for many years among them, 
not finally leaving the country until 1859, and I had the means of studying their character. I had not been a fortnight in Ireland before I was to be sent down to a little town in the far west of County Galway, to balance a defaulting postmaster's accounts, find out how much he owed, and report upon his capacity to pay. In these days such accounts are very simple. They adjust themselves from day to day, and a post office surveyor has nothing to do with them. At that time, though the sums dealt with were small, the forms of dealing with them were very intricate. I went to work, however, and made that defaulting postmaster teach me the use of those forms. I then succeeded in balancing the account, and had no difficulty whatever in reporting that he was altogether unable to pay his debt. Of course he was dismissed, but he had been a very useful man to me. I never had any further difficulty in the matter. But my chief work was the investigating of complaints made by the public as to postal matters. The practice of the office was and is to send one of its servants to the spot to see the complainant and to inquire into the facts, when the complainant is sufficiently energetic or sufficiently big to make himself well heard. A great expense is often incurred for a very small object, but the system works well on the whole, as confidence is engendered and a feeling is produced in the country that the department has eyes of its own and does keep them open. This employment was very pleasant, and to me always easy, as it required at its close no more than the writing of a report. There were no accounts in this business, no keeping of books, no necessary manipulation of multitudinous forms. I must tell of one such complaint and inquiry, because in its result I think it was emblematic of many. A gentleman in County Cavan had complained most bitterly of the injury done to him by some arrangement of the post office. The nature of his grievance has no present significance, but it was so unendurable that he had written many letters, couched in the strongest language. He was most irate, and indulged himself in that scorn which is easy to an angry mind. The place was not in my district, but I was borrowed, being young and strong, that I might remember the edge of his personal wrath. It was midwinter, and I drove up to his house, a squire's country seat, in the middle of a snowstorm, just as it was becoming dark. I was on an open, jaunting car, and was on my way from one little town to another, the cause of his complaint having reference to some mail conveyance between the two. I was certainly very cold and very wet and very uncomfortable when I entered his house. I was admitted by a butler, but the gentleman himself hurried into the hall. I at once began to explain my business. "'God bless me,' he said. "'You are wet through. John, get Mr. Trollope some brandy and water. Very hot.' I was beginning my story about the post again when he himself took off my greatcoat and suggested that I should go up to my bedroom before I troubled myself with business. Bedroom? I exclaimed. Then he assured me that he would not turn a dog out on such a night as that, and into a bedroom I was shown, having first drank the brandy and water standing at the drawing-room fire. When I came down I was introduced to his daughter, and the three of us went in to dinner. I shall never forget his righteous indignation when I again brought up the postal question on the departure of the young lady. Was I such a goth as to contaminate wine with business? So I drank my wine, and then heard the young lady sing while her father slept in his armchair. I spent a very pleasant evening, but my host was too sleepy to hear anything about the post office that night. It was absolutely necessary that I should go away the next morning after breakfast, and I explained that the matter must be discussed then. He shook his head and wrung his hands in unmistakable disgust, almost in despair. "'But what am I to say in my report?' I asked. "'Anything you please,' he said. "'Don't spare me if you want an excuse for yourself. Here I sit all the day with nothing to do, and I, I like writing letters.' I did report that Mr. Blank was now quite satisfied with the postal arrangement of his district, and I felt a soft regret that I should have robbed my friend of his occupation. Perhaps he was able to take up the poor law board, or to attack the excise. At the post office nothing more was heard from him. 
I went on with the hunting surveyor at Banagher for three years, during which at Kingston, the watering place near Dublin, I met Rose Heseltine, the lady who has since become my wife. The engagement took place when I had been just one year in Ireland, but there was still a delay of two years before we could be married. She had no fortune, nor had I any income beyond that which came from the post office, and there were still a few debts, which would have been paid off no doubt sooner but for that purchase of the horse. When I had been nearly three years in Ireland we were married on the 11th of June, 1844, and perhaps I ought to name that happy day as the commencement of my better life, rather than the day on which I first landed in Ireland. For though during these three years I had been jolly enough, I had not been altogether happy. The hunting, the whiskey punch, the rattling Irish life, of which I could write a volume of stories were this the place to tell them, were continually driving from my mind the still cherished determination to become a writer of novels. When I reached Ireland I had never put pen to paper, nor had I done so when I became engaged and when I was married, being then twenty-nine, I had only written the first volume of my first work. This constant putting off of the day of work was a great sorrow to me. I certainly had not been idle in my new birth. I had learned my work, so that everyone concerned knew that it was safe in my hands, and I held a position altogether the reverse of that in which I was always trembling while I remained in London. But that did not suffice, did not nearly suffice. I still felt that there might be a career before me if I could only bring myself to begin the work. I did not think I much doubted my own intellectual sufficiency for the writing of a readable novel. What I did doubt was my own industry and the chances of the market. The vigor necessary to prosecute two professions at the same time is not given to everyone, and it was only lately that I had found the vigor necessary for one. There must be early hours, and I had not as yet learned to love early hours. I was still indeed a young man, but hardly young enough to trust myself to find the power to alter the habits of my life. And I had heard of the difficulties of publishing, a subject of which I shall have to say much should I ever bring this memoir to a close. I had dealt already with publishers on my mother's behalf, and knew that many a tyro who could fill a manuscript lacked the power to put his matter before the public. And I knew, too, that when the matter was printed, how little had then been done towards the winning of the battle. I had already learned that many a book, many a good book, quote, is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air, unquote. But still, the purpose was strong within me, and the first effort was made after the following fashion. I was located at a little town called Drumsna, or rather village, in the county Latrum, where the postmaster had come to some sorrow about his money, and my friend John Merivale was staying with me for a day or two. As we were taking a walk in that most uninteresting country, we turned up through a deserted gateway, along a weedy, grass-grown avenue, till we came to the modern ruins of a country house. It was one of the most melancholy spots I ever visited. I will not describe it here, because I have done so in the first chapter of my first novel. We wandered about the place, suggesting to each other causes for the misery we saw there, and while I was still among the ruined walls and decayed beams, I fabricated the plot of the McDermott's of Ballycloran. As to the plot itself, I do not know that I ever made one so good, or at any rate one so susceptible of pathos. I am aware that I broke down in the telling, not having yet studied the art. Nevertheless, The McDermott's is a good novel, and worth reading by anyone who wishes to understand what Irish life was before the potato disease, the famine, and the encumbered estates bill. When my friend left me, I set to work and wrote the first chapter or two. Up to this time I had continued the practice of castle building, of which I have spoken, but now the castle I built was among the ruins of that old house. The book, however, hung with me. It was only now and then that I found either time or energy for a few pages. I commenced the book in September 1843, and had only written a volume when I was married in June 1844. 
my marriage was like the marriage of other people and of no special interest to any one except my wife and me it took place at rotherham in yorkshire where her father was the manager of a bank we were not very rich having about four hundred pounds a year on which to live many people would say that we were two fools to encounter such poverty together i can only reply that since that day i have never been without money in my pocket and that i soon acquired the means of paying what i owed nevertheless more than twelve years had to pass over our heads before i received any payment for any literary work which afforded an appreciable increase to our income immediately after our marriage i left the west of ireland and the hunting surveyor and joined another in the south it was a better district and i was enabled to live at clonmel a town of some importance instead of at banagher which is little more than a village i had not felt myself to be comfortable in my old residence as a married man on my arrival there as a bachelor i had been received most kindly but when i brought my english wife i fancied that there was a feeling that i had behaved badly to ireland generally when a young man has been received hospitably in an irish circle i will not say that it is expected of him that he should marry some young lady in that society but it certainly is expected of him that he shall not marry any young lady out of it i had given offence and i was made to feel it there has taken place a great change in ireland since the days in which i lived at banagher and a change so much for the better that i have sometimes wondered at the obduracy with which people have spoken of the permanent ill condition of the country wages are now nearly double what they were then the post office at any rate is paying almost double for its rural labour nine shillings a week when it used to pay five shillings and twelve shillings a week when it used to pay seven shillings banks have sprung up in almost every village rents are paid with more than english punctuality and the religious enmity between the classes though it is not yet dead is dying out soon after i reached banagher in eighteen forty one i dined one evening with a roman catholic i was informed next day by a protestant gentleman who had been very hospitable to me that i must choose my party i could not sit both at protestant and catholic tables such a caution would now be impossible in any part of ireland home rule no doubt is a nuisance and especially a nuisance because the professors of the doctrine do not at all believe in it themselves there are probably no other twenty men in england or ireland who would be so utterly dumbfounded and prostrated were home rule to have its way as the twenty irish members who profess to support it in the house of commons but it is not to be expected that nuisances such as these should be abolished at a blow home rule is at any rate better and more easily managed than the rebellion at the close of the last century it is better than the treachery of the union less troublesome than o'connell's monster meetings less dangerous than smith o'brien in the battle of the cabbage garden at ballingarry and very much less bloody than fenianism the descent from o'connell to mr butt has been the natural declension of a political disease which we had no right to hope would be cured by any one remedy when i had been married a year my first novel was finished in july eighteen forty five i took it with me to the north of england and entrusted the manuscript to my mother to do with it the best she could among the publishers in london no one had read it but my wife nor as far as i am aware has any other friend of mine ever read a word of my writing before it was printed she i think has so read almost everything to my very great advantage in matters of taste i am sure i have never asked a friend to read a line nor have i ever read a word of my own writing aloud even to her with one exception which shall be mentioned as i come to it i have never consulted a friend as to a plot or spoken to any one of the work i have been doing my first manuscript i gave up to my mother agreeing with her that it would be as well that she should not look at it before she gave it to a publisher i knew that she did not give me credit for the sort of cleverness necessary for such work i could see it in the faces and hear in the voices of those of my friends who were around me at the house in cumberland my mother my sister my brother-in-law and i think my brother that they had not expected me to come out as one of the family authors 
there were three or four in the field before me and it seemed to be almost absurd that another should wish to add himself to the number my father had written much those long ecclesiastical descriptions quite unsuccessfully my mother had become one of the popular authors of the day my brother had commenced and had been fairly well paid for his work my sister mrs tilly had also written a novel which was at the time in manuscript which was published afterwards without her name and it was called collerton i could perceive that this attempt of mine was felt to be an unfortunate aggravation of the disease my mother however did the best she could for me and soon reported that mr newby of mortimer street was to publish the book it was to be printed as his expense and he was to give me half the profits half the profits many a young author expects much from such an undertaking i can with truth declare that i expected nothing and i got nothing nor did i expect fame or even acknowledgment i was sure that the book would fail and it did fail most absolutely i never heard of a person reading it in those days if there was any notice taken of it by any critic of the day i did not see it i never asked any questions about it or wrote a single letter on the subject to the publisher i have mr newby's agreement with me in duplicate and one or two preliminary notes but beyond that i did not have a word from mr newby i am sure that he did not wrong me and that he paid me nothing it is probable that he did not sell fifty copies of the work but of what he did sell he gave me no account i do not remember that i felt in any way disappointed or hurt i am quite sure that no word of complaint passed my lips i think i may say that after the publication i never said a word about the book even to my wife the fact that i had written and published it and that i was writing another did not in the least interfere with my life or with my determination to make the best i could of the post office in ireland i think that no one knew that i had written a novel but i went on writing the mcdermott's was published in eighteen forty seven and the kellys and the o'kellys followed in eighteen forty eight i changed my publisher but did not change my fortune this second irish story was sent into the world by mr colburn who had long been my mother's publisher who reigned in great marlborough street and i believe created the business which is now carried on by monsieur hurston blackett he had previously been in partnership with mr bentley in new burlington street i made the same agreement as before as to half profits and with precisely the same results the book was not only not read but was never heard of at any rate in ireland and yet it is a good irish story much inferior to the mcdermott's as to plot but superior in the mode of telling again i held my tongue and not only said nothing but felt nothing any success would i think have carried me off my legs but i was altogether prepared for failure though i thoroughly enjoyed the writing of these books i did not imagine when the time came for publishing them that any one would condescend to read them but in reference to the o'kellys there arose a circumstance which set my mind to work on a subject which has exercised it much ever since i made my first acquaintance with criticism a dear friend of mine to whom the book had been sent as have all my books wrote me word to ireland that he had been dining at some club with a man high in authority among the gods of the times newspaper and that this special god had almost promised that the o'kellys should be noticed in that most influential of organs the information moved me very much but it set me thinking whether the notice should it even appear would not have been more valuable at any rate more honest if it had been produced by other means if for instance the writer of the notice had been instigated by the merits or demerits of the book instead of by the friendship of a friend and i made up my mind then that should i continue this trade of authorship i would have no dealings with any critic on my own behalf i would neither ask for nor deplore criticism nor would i ever thank a critic for praise or quarrel with them even in my own heart for censure to this rule i have adhered with absolute strictness and this rule i would recommend to all young authors what can be got by touting among the critics is never worth the ignominy 
the same may of course be said of all things acquired by ignominious means but in this matter it is so easy to fall into the dirt facilis de sensus averni there seems to be but little fault in suggesting to a friend that a few words in this or that journal would be of service but any praise so obtained must be an injustice to the public for whose instruction and not for the sustentation of the author such notices are intended and from such mild suggestion the descent to crawling at the critic's feet to the sending of presents and at last to a mutual understanding between critics and criticized is only too easy other evils follow for the denouncing of which this is hardly the place though i trust i may find such place before my work is finished i took no notice of my friend's letter but i was not the less careful in watching the times at last the review came a real review in the times i learned it by heart and can now give if not the words the exact purport of the kellys and the o'kellys we may say what the master said to his footman when the man complained of the constant supply of legs of mutton on the kitchen table well john legs of mutton are good substantial food and we may say also what john replied substantial sir yes they are substantial but a little coarse that was the review and even that did not sell the book from mr colburn i did receive an account showing that three hundred seventy five copies of the book had been printed that one hundred forty had been sold to those i presume who liked substantial food though it was coarse and that he had incurred a loss of sixty three pounds nineteen shillings one and a half pence the truth of the account i never for a moment doubted nor did i doubt the wisdom of the advice given to me in the following letter though i never thought of obeying it great marlborough street november eleventh eighteen forty eight my dear sir i am sorry to say that absence from town and other circumstances have prevented me from earlier inquiring into the results of the sale of the kellys and the o'kellys with which the greatest efforts have been used but in vain the sale has been i regret to say so small that the loss upon the publication is very considerable and it appears clear to me that although in consequence of the great number of novels that are published the sale of each with some few exceptions must be small yet it is evident that readers do not like novels on irish subjects as well as on others thus you will perceive it is impossible for me to give any encouragement to you to proceed in novel writing as however i understand you have nearly finished the novel la vendee perhaps you will favour me with the sight of it when convenient i remain etc etc h colburn this though not strictly logical was a rational letter telling a plain truth plainly i did not like the assurance that the greatest efforts had been used thinking that any efforts which might be made for the popularity of a book ought to have come from the author but i took in good part mr colburn's assurance that he could not encourage me in the career i had commenced i would have bet twenty to one against my own success but by continuing i could lose only pen and paper and if the one chance in twenty did turn up in my favour then how much might i win End of chapter 4 Recording by Jessica Louise, St. Paul, Minnesota